good evening, good afternoon, good morning to all of you tuning in from wherever you are around the world. I hope you're all staying happy and healthy. My name is Luke, I'm a producer here at How To Academy, and welcome to what I'm sure is going to be an absolutely fantastic event. Now, you're all in for an absolute treat today because we are joined by Dr. Lisa Miller, Professor of Psychology and Education at Columbia University and founder of the Spirituality Mind Body Institute, the first Ivy League graduate program in spirituality and psychology. Lisa is the author of The Awakened Brain, The Psychology of Spirituality and Our Search for Meaning, which is out now. And that is, of course, why you're all here today, to, to learn from an expert about the neuroscience of spirituality and about how these two seemingly opposite worlds intersect, interact and even inform one another. So after a 40 minute or so lecture, Lisa will take questions from you, the audience. So please type any you have into the little Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Well, that's more than enough from me. So without further ado, it is my absolute pleasure to welcome Dr. Lisa Miller. Lisa, over to you. Luke, thank you. And I'm so grateful to join you and to join the members of your thought community, a beautiful international community of creative thinkers. So thank you for including me today. I'm coming to you as a clinical scientist and clinical psychologist of about 25 years. And when I first started out in the 90s, there was literally no peer review science at all on personal spiritual life and its impact on health, wellness, recovery, or even as part and parcel of treatment, the studies that define the parameters of what good psychotherapy is, what the portrait of mental health looks like were silent. So at the time, it was abundantly clear to me that those patients whom I was seeing who had some form of transcendent awareness, some form of connection with their higher power, who were perhaps in or without of a faith tradition, but nonetheless spiritually oriented, had an entirely different road of recovery and life simply looked different to them. So a mental health field silent on spirituality made no sense. And back then in the 90s, I set to work as fellow labs have around the world. And we now have a robust peer reviewed science on spirituality, mental health, recovery, wellness, and even performance. And before we get deep in, I want to be clear about what is meant by spirituality. If you might consider an overlapping Venn diagram, two circles, spirituality, religion, uh, about two thirds of people will say I am spiritual and I am religious. For me, my spiritual life is held in my faith tradition. The prayers, the texts, the ceremonies, the values, my community hold my felt sense of connection to God, Allah, Hashem, the higher power. About 30% of millennials and fewer with each older generation will say I am spiritual, but I am not religious. For me, I feel a deep connection to the life force, to God, to what my how, or, how my power power is understood when I am in nature, when I see my family, when I experience art or music. Whether or not spirituality is held within or without of religion, the focus of the science we're looking into together today is primarily on spirituality. And let's get even deeper into the weeds then. What is spirituality? So scientists are not theologians. They don't define the nature of the universe, the cosmos, or what to call the higher power. But scientists can look at threads within lived human spiritual life and pull out those threads that have enormous impact on the rest of our lives. And look at those threads of lived human spiritual life and discern their origins, their ideology. And that is what we're talking about today, the high impact threads of lived spiritual life. It's not a comprehensive statement. It's not a definitive statement. It's not a theological statement of spirituality, but it is a clear empirically grounded look at threads within human lived spirituality that have an enormous impact on the rest of our lives and for which we have investigated the origins, the ideology of those dimensions of spiritual life. So let's dig in. Okay, if I might, ask you, Luke, uh, partner here for the first slide. Um, I get way into the science in the awakened brain, but I also weave together the empirical look of the past 20, 25 years with my own journey, uh, my own journey through depression to a deeper uh, spiritual connection with life. And I also share the stories of leaders in our world who themselves, through the depths of suffering, through the depths of despair, have dug deeper and realized 
a truer transcendent spiritual nature to life. So this is a blend of empirical science with a phenomenological journey through what is being mirrored in that body of science. I think of science perhaps as a form of witness. We can stand up and tell our own story one-on-one, -on -one, which is a phenomenological um, recount, or we can look at ourselves as a Greek chorus, as a community, and the voice of a study sample is an aggregate chorus of, of human experience. So of course, in many respects, they go hand in hand. Why now? Well, 25 years ago, when I started this research, I could have never dreamed that the summative scientific message would land now, right? As we move through the depth of despair and depression that has gone hand in hand with the pandemic. But as from an awakened perspective, um, the world is aligned and I share this science with you and perhaps you might share it with those who would benefit in a scene, and I'll give away here the punchline, that depression very often, despair is a gateway. It's an invitation to a deepening of our spiritual life. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't times where we need medication, and about one-third of depressions often have a biological piece broken that could be fixed, but about two-thirds of the time, developmental depression, the meat and potatoes of living, the grit of the human experience creates a form of depression, whether it's from the outer circumstances or our inner growth, that pulls us into a deeper reflective place where how we lived yesterday, same house, same family, same job, suddenly doesn't feel right. We've outsized it. And it's not because we need to shatter our lives, but it's because deep within us, we can inhabit our lives with a deeper understanding of who we are and the nature of life. So let's, let's roll. What do we know from 20 plus years of science? Luke, could I trouble you for the first aggregate finding? Again, specific references are in the awakened brain. I'll share with you an aggregate, <clears throat> the summative message in the awakened brain, the patterns in the science. First and foremost, very, very interesting. We are cognitive beings. We are physical beings. We are emotional beings. Based on twin studies, genetic epidemiological twin studies, we are all born inherently spiritual beings. How do we know that? We look at twins raised together, twins raised apart, and factor out the degree of commonality along any trait as a function of shared environment and shared dreams. So IQ is about 60% heritable, 40% environmentally formed. Temperament is about half and half. The capacity through which we experience spiritual life is one-third innate, two-thirds socialized. And more specifically, what thread within lived human spiritual life a deep transcendent awareness to be in a felt dynamic relationship with one's higher power, God, Allah, Hashem, the universe, the force in life, the deep seat of awareness that draws us into a relationship, a transcendent relationship with the deeper spirit in life. And that, of course, can take on many terms and many sort of social cognitive packagings. That capacity to not just believe, but perceive a transcendent relationship is one-third heritable, two-thirds environmentally formed. So while we are all endowed with this muscle, by way of analogy, to build it, for instance, if you might think of a bicep, to build that up is the opportunity of our lifetimes in the first two decades of life when there's profound formative availability, but it is always there for us. Um, and we can do this in our 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, or 70s. It is always there for us. It is our birthright. Two-thirds environmental is, is, is quite a bit. So when we're young, our family, our pastor, priest, and mom, our nursery school teacher, our 10,000 exchanges in the high school locker room are all environmental determinants onto our formation. But at some point, we ensue, we pull forward our own environment. That is a matter of choice. Whether we walk in nature, whether we find a community of service, whether we cultivate a sense of deep reflection and connection with the spirit in life. That's a choice to lay forward in our own path and environment to cultivate the spiritual core. And that is profoundly empowering. And that is very far from determinism. Now with puberty, 
biological puberty, not just age. And again, at midlife, there are surges, just as our bodies change and our hair changes, we, in life we might get gray, at puberty we clearly have physical changes. There is a developmental path to innate spirituality. There are burgeonings. And with these burgeonings, if you might envision a larger vessel, we expand, there can at times be great illumination and connection, but there can also at times, as we try to settle into this augmented awareness, be times that feel like a half empty glass of spirituality. And that is indeed uh, very painful. It can be difficult to think, does life really have meaning? Have I lived up to the potential, not just to be big and strong and smart, but have I really served this world? Is my life has my life been one worth living? The bigger questions in life, whether or not we ask them yesterday, start appearing. And with the nagging of the head is a hunger of the heart. This is hardwired. And there's a biological clock, a surge at specific times in our life. And so too, just as from the inside out, there are moments that simply beckon us, often with existential emptiness, to find a deeper connection we are effectively experiencing a developmental depression. So too, there are times where from the outside, we can be prompted to think about life's greatest significance. The past year and a half has been that. There is absolutely no way to live through the past year and a half and not ponder the greater symphony of life. So whether from within or without, depression is a gateway to reflection. It is a call, it is an invitation. If we avail ourselves of this invitation and strengthen, if you will, our spiritual core. Next slide, thank you, Luke. We now know from 20 years of peer review science, a stand, someone a standard deviation above is compared to below the mean and a tendency to say, my personal spirituality is highly important to me. I turned to my higher power for guidance in times of difficulty. I ask a question and receive an answer. Maybe not a voice in my ear, but an alignment, a synchronicity, something that's revealed to me. Or nature is a sacred home to me. I know I am one with all life when I walk in the forest. That tendency to feel that we are deeply connected, love guided and held and never alone is associated with an 80% decreased relative risk of substance addiction. Again, a standard deviation above is compared to below the mean in that tendency a 60% decreased relative risk of major depression. Now remember, everyone gets depressed and depression is not just sadness. It can be edginess, it can be hollowness, it can be questions of not just self-worthiness, but the nature of life. Uh, two thirds of the time, that's a developmental depression. But within each invitation, we can develop a spiritual response to suffering, strengthen the muscle and are effectively protected against a more deepened major depression, an episode of a major depressive disorder. And we are also protected against recurrence. So not only is depression an invitation to a deepening of spiritual life, it is both um, a transitional realization of that moment, and it is a form of prevention against ensuing subsequent episodes. In perhaps one of the most important summative studies, Wu and colleagues um, did a meta-analysis, a quantitative study of studies, and found in a sample of over 2,000 tragically completed suicides and 5,000 matched controls, that there was a 62% decreased relative risk of completed suicide. And that went up to 82% decreased relative risk of completed suicide when personal spirituality was shared. So, this is already in us. Um, if you told me there is a pill at the pharmacy that my kids could take or I could take and we would be protected at this level against the diseases of despair, against risk for suicide, against addiction, I would take that every day. This is in our birthright. This is who we are. We need only to build our awareness, to strengthen our awareness to awaken, as I focus on in the book, our natural seat of awareness. Next slide. Thank you, Luke. So if we can build this at any point in our lives, it is a setup for the rest of our lives. Once it's built, once we spend time in care, 
reflecting and working towards awakening. We have built, if you will, by way of analogy, a spiritual core. So we have effectively built highways between regions in the brain. We have myelinated tracks between regions of the brain that were not there before. And whether it's two years later or 20 years later, it's entirely possible that we could step away from focusing on our spiritual life and not use our awakened awareness as much as we might. But it's there if we can return to it that much more readily. So any time spent is, is really creating an opening for the rest of our lives. So we've looked at the protective benefits of spiritual awareness, what I'm calling from a universal perspective, an awakened awareness, focusing on the seat of perception. Next slide, please, Luke. Thank you. Where is this seat of perception? This is a study that we published in JAMA Psychiatry in 2014. And what we found is that people with a sustained use of spirituality in daily life who see their family as sacred, who look into life at transcendent level, who use that lived dimension of being in constant dialogue or sense of connection with the transcendent, had thicker cortex. These are regions, broad and pervasive regions in red of greater thickness, a thicker cortex in these regions of the parietal, occipital, and precuneus, regions of perception, reflection, and orientation was particularly remarkable, remember the spiritual response to suffering, is that for having over in the study eight years sustained a strong spiritual life, whatever faith tradition they may or may not be in, Hindu, Jewish, Muslim, spiritual, but not religious, whatever faith tradition they may be in, Christian, Catholic, whatever they may be in, for having sustained a spiritual life, Looking into life in a resting state, looking into life coming and going looks entirely different when looked through the red brain. These are structural differences that went hand in hand with sustained spiritual life. And with 80% overlap, these regions of cortical thickness were not thick, but thin in people with re major recurrent depression, recurrent major depression. That means that we have some evidence that sustained spiritual life is neuroprotective against recurrence of depression. Think back to the model that we've been discussing. Depression is an invitation for a deepening of spiritual life. If we acknowledge the invitation, if we open ourselves to inquiry, to a quest, to look into life's deeper purpose, we don't need to have an answer. We don't need to join one tradition or another. If we're in a stance of spiritual inquiry and quest, we're spiritually on, we're in an awakened state of awareness. We are neuroprotective against recurrent depression. Next slide, thank you, Luke. Let's look at the upside, the character strengths and virtues that have value in and of themselves, their virtues, but also which have enabled us to pursue that which we care about in life. They give us traction and perhaps if you will, outward success, whatever our goals may be. Grit, persistence, optimism. Let me invite you to think of someone you know full of optimism and now someone very resilient, now someone full of commitment. How many people were you thinking of? Uh, very often people say one, there's many terrific people, but someone springs to mind as being full of character strengths and virtues. And that is because if I might please ask for the next slide, the character strengths and virtues don't sprinkle evenly among us. They cluster in the same people. This is a sample of 5,500 college students in the United States. The folks in blue are high in everything. If we look along the x-axis, they are high in meaning, grit, optimism, gratitude, and forgiveness. These are organically derived classes uh, through latent class analysis. It's a way to pull out organic categories. The folks in red are low in everything. And the folks in green right down the middle show you that whether I'm blue, green, or red, high, medium, or low, the character strengths and virtues cluster at a level that might best suggest that we're looking at a singular trait, character, virtue. For all but the purple line, for 85% of young adults, the extent to which one has character, virtue, which enables good performance, which enables ethics, which enables relational dignity, goes hand in hand with daily spiritual awareness on the far left. And when we then looked in other samples, we found this to be the case of all different ages. 
And when we then looked longitudinally at what came first, we found that it was in fact a daily spiritual awareness that led to a life full of grit, a led to a life with persistence and commitment. So why is that? Well, if I might look at the next slide, if you think about for the moment, uh, life with and without a spiritual core, right? 